So this panel is about the Internet of Things, and uh, this is kind of uh, this is the last panel of this conference, and it's actually going to be uh, a large part of uh, the discussion that we will have at the next workshop in Hong Kong, which will all be on uh, smart contracts for smart cities. Um, so the way in which we want, uh, would like to frame the discussion now is um, when we talk about the Internet of Things, then how should we actually design it? So the Internet of Things is basically inherently decentralized in the sense that we're talking about multiple devices interacting with each other, but then who is controlling how those devices are interacting with each other? Um, how can we actually design smart cities which are empowering the citizen, which actually provide citizens to be a smart citizen and not just uh, um, not victim, but just like uh, subject to the control of the people that are, that are controlling those devices. So um, uh, we have this uh, really uh, beautiful panel of uh, designers and uh, engineers. So I would like to start with uh, Henny um, from uh, IBM. If, um, if you can present a little bit, uh, how, how do you envision, from your uh, own personal vision, how do you think that uh, the Internet of Things should be um, designed at the architectural level, at the control level? So how do we get uh, devices which are separate and which are individual, but how can we get a coordination between those devices without going into the centralized system? Right. So, um, I mean, uh, as Ruth said, my personal opinion, because I cannot speak for IBM here. I am not even uh, officially a client of the Internet of Things as of yet, I believe. But um, in my personal view, I mean, and in my personal work, what has become apparent, because we're central, centrally, we're looking at blockchain here. Um, one of the beautiful things that you talk about, IoT and blockchain, and uh, the decentralized nature of the blockchain becomes, and uh, put into very sharp focus. Because as soon as you take out the decentralized nature of the blockchain and reduce it to a centrally controlled blockchain, what's left is something that in many cases you can do just as well with, uh, like it's a decentralized system, that do not need all of the overhead and all of the um, complications that you can also have with implementing something with blockchain. So we have existing IoT technology, it works pretty well, um, and it's easily centralized. So if we talk in this context about um, the Internet of Things, then um, Mihaela has uh, uh, advocated me today, and as uh, already said to me in the past, um, she was, uh, was writing about the democracy of things. And that's something that, of course, goes even beyond what um, was just presented, um, where from Strange is in view that we should um, insist that the technology today is part of ourselves, and that we should insist that regulations and law should respect that. You could uh, go beyond that to a vision that's even more exciting maybe, that's even potentially more threatening, and that is that the devices could own themselves. And of course, in the, in the context of blockchains and in the concept, concept of, uh, in the context of um, DAOs, uh, we are talking about things that are actually having their own lives and that govern themselves. And that might also be a way to think about um, escaping um, <coughs> the threat of monopoly and the potential threat also in the, uh, inhibited development by centralized architecture. So it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, all, it's even uh, it's more far-reaching um, uh, vision going into the future, I guess. And uh, personally, I'm very, very interested in, in finding out about these things, um, where, where that goes when we try to uh, talk about something that I think will inevitably come, where devices are really um, uh, self-sufficient and are really, uh, in, in the end, entities to themselves. So um, I, I would like to, um, to say that uh, in this, uh, this whole discussion, of course, um, we shouldn't be too pessimistic and, and see that we're now um, might be owned by too few in the future um, if, if people see that they actually um, have interests that are in the moment uh, misused or abused then uh, I believe that our societies are strong enough that laws will change and regulations will change 
um, and as long as it works as long as it works under the carpet and nobody really sees it then yes there's there's the power of corporations to take rights away but um, I, I'm a strong believer in, uh, in, in progress in that sense and I think it's uh, it's really uh, quite promising what we could uh, see in the future but um, so from a um from an actual design perspective, right? From, from, a, from a technical perspective. Um, so let's say that a big corporation, IBM or whoever it, it can be, um, wants to design a system, it wants to think, etc. Um, wouldn't be the natural solution that they take is because they have their own personal interest of like collecting data and whatnot, to actually take it in a, the most centralized manner possible because obviously they need to get return in exchange. And in that case, um, who else will be producing those uh, those systems in a way that is completely decentralized? And uh, what will be what will be their incentive for the, for those people to take those those, those decentralized systems? And then, most importantly, perhaps, is um, at the level of the control. So when we have a centralized system, the the drawback is obviously that everything is under surveillance. Uh, the advantage, let's say, is that if we actually create something that doesn't work, that has a bug, that is like not working properly, it is quite easy to control and to fix it or to like shut it down or whatnot. Um, if we actually create those decentralized systems where indeed we have autonomous or semi-autonomous devices that are not controlled by anyone, so we might get less of a surveillance by the centralized entity, but then what will happen um, when this device actually, for some, uh, for some reason, X or Y, um, breaks out or is actually acting against the interests of people for reasons that we could not envision before, then can we stop them or um, what can we do? Well, okay, if I should answer to that again. Um, so, first of all, I think uh, it's a fallacy to believe that uh, business models can be driven by data uh, indefinitely into the future because Inherently, um, data b being sucked in by more and more data points is becoming less and less valuable. And uh, because it's just, there's going to be an overabundance. So um, the view that we might have right now of data being the driver commercially of all that, what we will see in the future is probably not going to hold water. There will have to be different business models and the thirst for, for data might not be what actually is going to drive corporations to, um, to do really interesting Internet of Things stuff. Um, the other aspect, and that's of course a very, um, very valid um, proposition, that uh, centralization also gives you security and protection. That's very hard to answer, but I think um, in that moment again, uh, democracy is uh, part of the answer, and blockchain is part of the answer because um, the vision for Internet of Things in the blockchain is that actually if you buy a device that might be malicious from somewhere and you plug it into your home blockchain, the other devices are going to police it. And if it's corrupt, and that could be just, could be unintentionally just having a bug, then the other devices are not going to talk to it anymore because it's not going to speak sense. So in that respect, we have these seeds of democracy embodied in, in the way that the, a blockchain works that uh, could be the most viable way to protect us going forward. Okay, so on that point, I would like to uh, ask Jeremy Pitt. So we had a short discussion already on uh, the concept of the difference between regulation by code and uh, governance by design. Um, so I don't know exactly what is the real difference, but uh, regulation by code to me seems more like something that is uh, um, imposed. It's more of a top-down thing. So there is a producer that is going to design a particular appliance or a device and he's going to encode particular rules within this device. Um, and then the concept of governance by design, which seems more of a bottom-up and grassroots uh, uh, system, where it is the community, the community of, of people using the device, or why not the community of devices, that will govern themselves and that will use technology in order to ensure that there is a proper coordination and that everything works out as, ma as, as, as good as possible. So, uh, would you like to discuss a little bit how you think this could apply to the Internet of Things? Uh, <coughs> thank you. Uh, actually, I'd just like to uh, step back a bit and put it into context. So, 
So uh, I work at uh, Imperial College, and uh, I prefer to emphasize the college rather than the Imperial, uh, where I, I, I teach software engineering, uh, human-computer interaction, artificial intelligence, and also teach on our continual professional, sorry, continual professional development course, yeah? uh, where I try to get our students to think about the impact that their technology will have on society and to try and consider the legal, ethical, and social framework in which their software products might have to operate. <coughs> you might think of this as computer science with a social conscience. Uh, the success of my labors is indicative uh, of the number of them that go and work for banks anyway, or desire to get internships for Google. Uh, <coughs> I really should get you to <laughs> talk to them uh, yeah. instead. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, uh, I should say, I am dismayed by the number of them who want to go and work for companies that will make platforms that either enable or encourage the commodification of social relationships, the narrow determinism of prescri prescriptive analytics uh, and uh, surveillance, uh, and the appropriation of public spaces in pursuit of private gain uh, under the guise that you're producing a disruptive technology. Uh, on the other hand, I am enthused by the potential of blockchain technology, Internet of Things, uh, and self-organizing systems technology uh, to converge with theories from the social sciences uh, uh, to address collective action problems uh, that we see in digital communities. And on this basis, I work on uh, subjects I refer to variously as computational justice, algorithmic um, governance and al algorithmic self-governance, uh, collective attention, uh, and electronic social capital. Uh, and these technologies, I believe, can be can put together with design contractualism, uh, which is uh, uh, making sure that the designers of the technology make certain legal, ethical, and social judgments and embed those uh, in their devices, and then their devices can actually act upon them in a way to uh, offer the guarantees uh, that uh, Primavera is talking about. So the two things go hand in hand. It's the technology with the training of the people to use that technology responsibly. One third uh, point, uh, it is a private ballot in this country, but I am prepared to reveal at this point that I did not vote for this one. <laughs> Okay, um, now uh, I would like to take the example, uh, I don't know if Ivan is still up, the example of, for instance, uh, the button. So, um, uh, Aaron explained how now we can create those devices, so where you can create a bottle and you can know exactly when the bottle is open and how this could actually become extremely useful in the sense of, for instance, uh, in order to enforce laws against uh, being able to drink before uh, being 21. So um, the Internet of Things actually allows to uh, create these uh, smart devices which can be used for, in fact, to regulate and to self-regulate, but also in order to restrict the, um, the behavior of people. So um, to which extent, like, who, who should be in charge of actually deciding what kind of constraints we can impose, what kind of constraints can be incorporated within one device, and especially if it's in a decentralized manner, then who can control when those uh, particular regulations which are encoded into the device should actually be enforced, and if they shouldn't be enforced, then what can we do in order not to enforce those? Is this for me? Mm -hmm. um, okay, so, so my answer to that uh, is that uh, you're looking to uh, apply principles of localization, subsidiarity, self-governance, put it down as low in the uh, hierarchy as possible. Uh, and why I say that, some of the work that we have done uh, has, I said, mentioned taking uh, ideas and theories from the social sciences, is one that we've worked on in particular is to take uh, Eleanor Ostrom's uh, principles for uh, institutional design uh, for sustainable common pool resource management uh, and to try and code them uh, in computational logic. Uh, and we succeeded in doing that and the result is uh, a, a specification in the form of uh, rules. Uh, <coughs> these are represented in a programming language prologue, and that means the specification is its own implementation. 
so then we can directly operate uh, these rules. They can be executed as part of the platform. So one of these principles, though, uh, is that those who are affected by rules participate in their modification and selection. So in the design of these rules, it is the people who are affected by them who actually get to choose them. And if we can do it from that uh, principle, from the bottom up, uh, we, can, we can create sustainable institutions. And just one last thing. Seventh uh, principle that uh, of Eleanor Ostrom talked about uh, was uh, minimal recognition of the right to self-organize. So what this means again is that it's not that uh, you're able to come up with any form of uh, rules, it's the fact that you're able to move around the space uh, deciding which rules that you want. It also turns out that part of uh, um, uh, this uh, right to self-organize uh, includes your own incentive system. Uh, and so uh, this is where uh, uh, I think the idea of cryptocurrency uh, can be especially valuable, is that within the self-organizing uh, uh, digital communities, uh, you can have incentive systems which are basically based on uh, some form of currency which only has va value uh, within that uh, community. And this is the way that you can get around uh, the commodification of social relationships because it only exists within, only has value within that community, but it can still be levered to uh, attain collective action results. Okay, um, so Mihela, um, so you inspired, I guess, many years ago the concept of democracy of devices. Do you want to describe it? Um, I, I have to make a comment first. So I believe that you guys uh, got us to talk about devices because you were too afraid that we we're going to talk about people and maybe we're go <laughs> not going to say what you want us to. So um, I'm going first to really um, express my thanks to our keynote speaker for putting the R in the blo blockchain revolution at last. And uh, uh, I would like to ask, uh, not, not necessarily you, but uh, the room, because this is a workshop about the blockchain. What is the blockchain enabling? So I think, you know, when we design for devices or for people, when we design systems, yes, what do we enable? Do we enable democracy and what is that? Do we enable the legacy institutions? Do we enable which kind of tree from the ones which you showed us? And I think that is a fundamental question. Once we have answered that, I think for devices or for people, we have the problem half solved. And, uh, you know, my, uh, my dream, and I will answer your question, but, but um, my dream is that we will design it for the self-organized autocracies, those that uh, will not need, hopefully, uh, money from the VCs, and that will crowdfund the sustainable uh, cities and communities of the future to, you know, create through the maker movement, the next generation solar panels and trade energy according to Ostrom's common pool resources uh, rules, which will be embedded in the system through algorithmic governance. So I think the design for such social technical systems that can be deployed easily and in an ethical manner is the question here. And I see the blockchain as an enabling technology for such systems. I can speak much more to the details of the design, but I think uh, I will stop now. I just wanted to reframe the question. Okay. Um, and then, uh, so Pradeep, uh, would you like to? Thank you. Um, I'm gonna sort of give a little preamble and then try and hopefully link some threads up more for myself than necessarily for you. Um, so I'm at an art school and it's always sort of interesting for me, so, so what, why am I interested in blockchains? Why am I actually here? So I'm based in Rhode Island in the US. And we churn out artists and designers every year. A number of them do go to Silicon Valley. A number of them do go to Brooklyn. A number of them do disappear into attics and paint for the rest of their life. 
why am I interested in, in, in this? And we talked to, earlier, I think people talked about homo economicus. And there are many different types of homos. There's homo faber, so man is maker. And I think that's kind of sort of the maker movement. So we have a number of students that want to make things. And when they go out, they can't help themselves but make things, whether it's a painting or an object or Airbnb or other organizations or other ways that, that are maybe more of the same or disruptive. And one of the problems we've got is that everyone in cities around the world, and I've worked in many countries, New Zealand, Australia, England, and now the States, are chasing Silicon Valley. Everyone wants to be the next Silicon Valley. And the issue from a design and art perspective is there are other economies to look at that are not about technology. So we've started talking a lot about artisanal, artisanal economies. And so economies that are based on an artisanal model, and in some ways this is going back to the arts and crafts, this is going back to uh, homo faber, this is going back to man the maker. And what is different from Ruskin and William Morris's period is that we now have technologies which they would hate that actually allow us to achieve their dream. So with blockchain, with Bitcoin, with these sort of cryptocurrencies, we have the opportunity to actually set up relational economies where people can actually follow where the goods have come from. They can all have part share. Um, and so a couple of things sort of, sort of around that maker movement and how really the, this hyper-connectivity and this ability to follow connections allow small collaboratives to set up. Um, it was interesting listening to uh, Michael's talk about the architectural industry. So the architectural industry for many, many years has been based on a master-servant contractual relationship. So there's a main contractor and there's subcontractors. So you get into this bind where you are basically protecting yourself against liability. And so the idea of, of people actually wanting to join in and solve the problem becomes much harder to do and buildings become more and more expensive because it's about risk management and control. There are other forms of contractual agreement like the collaborative working agreement where you all buy into a company, you set up a limited liability company, and you have both pain share and gain share. What's difficult with that is how do you actually follow people's contribution? And the blockchain, I believe, could allow quite a bit of that to be monitored and to be exposed and for more transparency. So I think there's things that are emerging from this conference for me and this whole conversation around blockchains that really feed into this artisanal economy. I also want to say that artisanal economies don't need to be small because one of the problems we always get with our students starting companies that want to build the next wheelchair or walking frames or next clothing line, how do you scale up? Because we talk about in Silicon Valley, it's all about viral growth, it's all about this exponential growth. Certainly in my experience, things that grow virally, you actually don't really want. So there's things about growth that I think also need to be challenged and certainly the artisanal economy we can grow by having multiple rather than making more of the same. So I think that there's things in the maker movement and art students and design that I think are fascinating for me and how we can actually build a different economic artisanal model. And we're seeing it, there's a company called Icebreaker, it's a New Zealand merino wool clothing company. They trace which sheep the merino wool came from. You can actually track it, you can um, see exactly where it came from. And if you think of the food industry, we're constantly talking about which farm the eggs were from. In fact, you can name the chicken that it came from. So I think there's something of interest in people that I think this could open up a new, certainly from my perspective in an art school, an artisanal model of working that goes back to the maker movement and to homo faber, but also allows this distributed wealth that I think is quite intriguing to play with. That's all. Okay. Um, so now I would like to ask uh, uh, three questions uh, for the whole panel and uh, whoever wants to answer. So the first one is just to build upon uh, what I have just presented, um, basically the, the present and the future and how those uh, technologies which seem the most convenient and the most attractive into the present might actually turn out to be quite negative for the human rights in the future. Um, so this is absolutely true in the internet and uh, we can see it with all the centralized platforms. But when it moves into the Internet of Things, then it becomes ever more critical in the sense that um, if Facebook decides to censor a particular picture, 
well, maybe I will not be able to see that picture. If uh, I cannot express myself, I will not be able to express myself to my friends by using the, the Facebook platform. But then um, what happens when it is actually my, um, my car, which a centralized entity will decide I can no longer drive it because of some particular action that I have done or because of some profiling which has been done on me. So um, I would like if uh, everyone from the panel or whoever wants to intervene, um, how do you see this tension between the, like the, the internet thing offer actually amazing uh, uh, new opportunities and new, new attractiveness to the people uh, we don't have to deal with anything because the house is all automated and is, it can deal with, they know exactly when we get home and they can make us coffee and eat up, etc. So all these uh, convenience that it offers, but uh, it becomes, of course, like as, as strong as the convenience of the present is strong, as more uh, critical becomes the potential drawback from the future. So how do you see this tension and how, how do you think we could uh, uh, explain to people and how can we actually create this narrative in order for the, the negative consequence for the future to be more visible, but to design nonetheless devices which are still maintain the same uh, advantage in terms of comfort and convenience from the present. Well, I, I think in this regard, um, the Internet of Things is really nothing special. Um, that's the curse of technology as a whole. And for me, uh, even um, the, the keyword of convenience, I mean, I, I, like, I like using my body. I, I like, uh, I like uh, passion, I like a challenge. And just the, the word convenience sounds evil to me almost. So, and, and the overall development that we are using technology, and first it's a great enabler, but then within a few uh, years actually, things that have uh, given you an advantage are just expected of you. So you're basically finding yourself in a trap. I mean, that was true for the car, that was true for mobile phones. And it's certainly nothing that I would see is um, a special feature of the Internet of Things in that regard. It's just another technology that we will uh, have to be thoughtful about how, how we use it. And that, that's, in the end, uh, to a very big extent, uh, a factor where uh, personal uh, responsibility and maturity comes in. I think just just uh, um, I think think there's 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 always an assumption that we think there is a right answer out there, and certainly when when you see um, issues with Nest, for example, in terms of monitoring how you heat or move and turn lights on in your house, um, how we use that data is still unclear, because no matter how whatever data it's collecting, it's always the wrong one. So for anyone that's done research to try and use that data, it's never the right data. And so there's always something about an assumption that we have a right answer that we're aiming to. We've got all of this um, theories around design cities, smart cities in particular, and we, we talk about um, how we can monitor en the energy efficiency of a building on the amount of light coming into a building. Um, yet we still can't get the garbage off the streets. We still have bags out there. We still don't really know there's a snowfall, how we're actually going to remove, I think we had 96 inches of snow in Boston this year. We still don't know how to remove that. The whole country, the whole city came to a standstill. So there are still things that um, we don't really know how to do, or we don't, we don't really know how to deal with inner city farms. So how do you actually get food into cities that are becoming mega cities? So I think there's a lot of assumptions. I think these problems are enormous. We're never, and I hope we never solve them, because then... It is going to be like that episode in Wall E that we're all floating around useless on sleds. I mean, these problems are constant. Once we've solved them, they will change. And so I think there's, there's sort of an assumption in, in um, a lot of technology will solve things for us. I don't think it will, and I hope it doesn't. And I hope it means that we continuously evolve and develop. So I think there's something about uh, this assumption that this is going to solve our freedoms. I don't think it will. Um, if I may, uh, Henny was saying that you know it's it's nothing new um, in terms of like the challenges that are brought on by Internet of Things, for example. Um, I think what's different is the degree uh, and the nature of the data that we are gathering. 
Um, so when we talk about Internet of Things, we're actually today in the mainstream with centralized systems actually talking about the Internet of Things that spy on you in your own home. And it's the in your own home bit that makes it far more personal uh, than in any other space. Um, and then we can go further now. We have wearables, um, which again, if centralized, and that's the key thing, if centralized, if you're not in ownership and control, um, then we are uh, being spied on uh, with the things that we wear, which are spying on us in, in the most personal way. Well, actually not the most personal way because we can go one further. There are health startups now um, with uh, pills that you can swallow and uh, therefore things like you know, uh, compliance with medicine taking, et cetera. Um, but really, their business model, their VC back, they sell your data from inside you. So we're getting increasingly more personal um, and again, the real danger is if there is a monopoly of this system, which comes back to what you were saying, Pradeep, um, that we don't have, uh, you know, we don't know how this data is being used to some degree. We do in any manner that they can use it is how it's being used. Um, there is no limitation. In a privacy policy, it tells you what they collect. It doesn't necessarily say how they use it because they don't know and they will use it in whichever manner they can going into the future, which is something that we can limit, of course, going forward. Um, so really, I think we need to look at the core uh, structures. Um, if it's centralized, if it monetizes data at, as its core business model, they're gonna use it for whatever they can, to whatever extent they can. It's like having a cake in the fridge and then saying, I'm not gonna eat it. You're going to eat that cake at some point, even if it's not today, it'll be tomorrow and we're retaining this data indefinitely as well. And, and if I may add to that, um, you know, Preeta Bansal, she mentioned the values, the human values that we are uh, promoting in society, or how are we as a society, and of course we all have choices and that will always be a debate. Yet I think here the blockchain as a technology is enforcing, as, as much as it is, you know, a verifiable exchange technology, is enforcing trust and accountability, which become now implicit. And, uh, and therefore, I think it will help us to redesign our institutional structures to be less coercive and put the accountability on us, on the individual. And I think that is the real empowerment that it, this technology can bring to us as a society to remind us of our values and, and our behaviors. So that's... Uh, so, so I see this as a, a tension between the technological uh, and the socio-political, in a sense. So, so one thing that we need to do is definitely be able, um, as I was saying, to reappropriate our, our own data. So we hear a lot about big data, and uh, really we need to uh, ensure that the generators of that data are the primary beneficiaries. But also we've got an opportunity to, to actually see what the results of um, policies would be. I mean, we should be able to uh, run simulations which show how much the 85 will benefit compared to the 3.5 billion, for example. So, uh, you know, The thing is, it's very hard to get the data of the 85 because they guard that really well. Privacy isn't dead for everyone equally. Yeah. So when Mark Zuckerberg buys his house, mm -hmm. he buys the houses on both sides as well because he really values his privacy while in the same breath he's telling you that you should forego yours. Exactly. And uh, but <coughs> Eric Schmidt does the same with Google. He tells you, you signed up to the Patriot Act? Look at it, yeah? So, um, so uh, at least there are things, some things that we can do. Uh, but 30 years of working in artificial intelligence uh, as, uh, as taught me something about framing. So all my little so-called AI programs, uh, they add various axioms and basically whatever you've put in, the output would depend on those axioms. And the thing is people are, are the same. So uh, even to the extent that um, they prefer to reject evidence if it means uh, updating their, their, uh, their axiom set. Uh, <coughs> and so the counter side to, to the data is uh, if you want to stay the 85, you just lie. 
if you lie long enough and often enough and strongly enough, uh, a sufficiently large number of the 3.5 billion will believe enough of what you say to keep on voting for you, and nothing will ever change. So I, I would like to uh, step back a little bit and, and just draw your attention to, I mean, just how you open that discussion then about these 85 that have um, as primary measurement money. And it's not so certain that the other 3.5 billion people that you're referring to find that this is actually the primary measurement of the lies which came. And um, that is something that in some uh, circles might sound like apologizing for it and just working for the 85 just meant it, but um, I for one believe in God which is one of the first things you ridicule. And of course you understand this arrogance. So there are holes in that, um, in, in that argumentation where I find like, um, if we go forward, and I mean, I, I believe that privacy is a basic human right and you cannot even develop in a full human being without privacy. Uh, on, on a much deeper level than even uh, the household data, uh, in, in, in all other social relationships, there has to be something there. And I think that's, that's a very European point of view in a certain way, that you also can see how people behave towards each other, or how people misunderstand each other, coming from one continent to the other. But um, being used to European protect data protection, um, I have a good precedent to believe that democracies are strong enough to protect at a certain point when they find it valuable enough um, what has to be protected, and privacy is one of those things. And of course, uh, we have a different situation in America, but in Germany, I saw startups not from coming from Silicon Valley not being able to do business in Germany because they were fundamentally violating privacy rights, so they couldn't do stuff. And it started actually with, um, with uh, companies who were, who were targeting banners on, on the internet. Some just couldn't use the technology in Germany, and that was, that was it. So I think um, we're, we're, the whole discussion about whether um, this is going to be um, a data-driven um, enslavement machine that we are facing, um, I think has to be looked upon a little bit from a meta level where, where I find that uh, if you want to go for a slave mentality, for example, that is visible in, in many, many different walks of our life. And um, if we are focusing only on what, what the Internet of Things would do to us if we don't overcome the slave mentality and, and, uh, and seize our rights that we have, and in the end, the state always trumps the corporations um, when, when they, yes, of course, people can always trump corporations when they come together and realize that they actually want to do something, then change, things change. And regulation and laws are made. And, and one final thing I would like to, I mean, in this topology where we have like, okay, monopoly, centralization, um, and democracy on the other side. Um, there was always, almost in the past, democracy was not always considered as optimal um, uh, government form. And uh, even in the very, very beginning, tyranny was actually not necessarily perceived as a bad form because there was this, this notion of, in times of need, there has to be um, something that is stronger than the oligarchies that are reigning, which is, would have been the nobility, and that was called an eternal tyrant, uh, who was expected to execute the will of the masses against the economical powerful. Now, I'm not uh, promoting tyranny here, but it's um, just uh, maybe one uh, pointer towards going beyond this, this bipolar view of things, where centralization is automatically bad, and, and decentralization is automatically um, the, the, the solution. Um, if I may, uh, I, I definitely don't want to make this into a, a debate on supernaturalism, um, but it is true entirely that it is a core tenet of a lot of religions um, to say to people, it's okay if you don't have anything in this life, you will have it in the next. So that is a beautiful way to continue the dominant power relationships that exist. Um, so I entirely agree with you there that there is a, a history of um, the dominant power systems being perpetuated through these uh, sort of institutions. Um, but this point about states being stronger than governments, um, I think if you look at the status quo today, uh, that 
is probably very hard to defend, given that we have multinational corporations that have annual incomes that are far greater than the GDPs of many countries combined, and that are not bound by the legislations of a single geographical location that can play one such jurisdiction against another. And once we get, if TTIP is ratified, for example, at that point, we are no longer living in a democracy. We're living in a corporatocracy. So we're at a point of losing that. It's not a matter of if or when. We're there. Whether or not we can veer away, I think, is the real question. No, I think we fundamentally believe that this bridge had to be built for others to, for it to be convenient to come over to the good tree. Yeah, and that might not be true. Maybe everybody has to do the walk down the tree and go to the other tree, and only then can we progress. But if convenience is, so to say, something that you think the masses will always display, then that's believing that because we are, we have to stay immature, or the mass will always stay immature, there can be no solution. And my point of view would be, we have to progress, everybody of us, and then that's, then that's inevitably going to be coming to a point where we, the people, as some like to say, will set new rules. And that's the meta context of it all. And it is interesting that you brought up this issue of gas. It reminds me of 20 years ago when we were designing with Jeremy multi-agent systems and I was invited on CBC at Easter and they asked me, so do you feel you are the goddess of this system that you are designing Internet of Things? So I'm just wondering. I think this brings me back to what our keynote speaker was talking about and that is the ethical design. So what kind of world do we want? This is now a fundamental question. And if we have the power to build it with our devices, how would we do it? So I think that comes back to your question and I think that may give an answer. And maybe we have some design experts here who have better ideas than me on that. To actually to go back to the question you asked the question, I, I would like also to jump on the, the idea that indeed is decentralization always negative and um, most importantly I guess we can look at what just what happened to Bitcoin or whatever. So sometimes you have technology that are so decentralized that then they can more easily be co-opted by centralized powers. And so if we actually want to ensure a system on Internet of Things um, that will actually empower the citizen, then do we actually need to uh, go to the pure decentralization or do we actually want to get a more communitarian um, approach and actually protect this technology in order to ensure that the devices are actually, so I go back to the concept of the democracy of devices, that there is no device that can actually get more powerful than others. And um, on this, I, I would like to jump on, on the idea of um, so we talked now about network neutrality, for instance, um, in the sense that we need to ensure that every packet on the internet, they have the same priority, otherwise a particular service, may, may, may a centralized service, will be much more attractive to users. Now, what about in, in, the, in the case of devices? So if we actually want to have a grassroots movement and we actually want to be able to, like with the artisan economy and with the do-it-yourself, etc., we want to be able to create our own devices, we want to create devices according to our own values and whatnot, then we also have to ensure that there is interoperability between those devices and the devices of other people and that they can all communicate and interoperate with each other so that indeed it is the quality and it is the quality of the service and of the device that matters and not whether or not there is more investment behind one particular Apple device as opposed to, uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to sort of argue for holding on to the complexity of the situation because I think we, we keep talking, it was interesting the sort of concept around ideologies because uh, are we in a democratic society, yes and no, because actually the, there are many, many different types of democracy. Do we sometimes have a, um, a meritocracy? Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. And I think in the same way that um, the Internet of Things or the de design of objects, that every single student that, that I work with, every single design is both enabled and constrained. And both of these things coexist. So there are some common platforms that they work from, there are some common technologies they work from, and then there are places where they can manipulate, they can improvise and make something up. So I think that holding on to complexity that we don't live in a pure democracy, 
there are people that will make a different quick decision in our work and government. Um, there are people that will make good decisions as well as bad decisions, some by in intention, some completely unintended. But I think this notion that um, we live in a pure internet of things and that it, it's going to be purely uh, machine-based conversations for end to end rather than P to P, um, it's not going to be that. It's going to be a bit of everything. We, we, I, I was in telecommunications for a long time. We were headed towards a paperless office. I've not seen so much paper in my entire life since. So I think the, I want to argue that the complexity is going to be maintained and that we are going to live in complex situations where people are going to design and they are going to need some common standards. They are going to need some common standards and even if you look at Arduino, there are some common inputs and outputs on connectivity. But what you can do in between those is almost infinite. And I think that's where creativity, human creativity is going to lie. So, so I kind of want to argue that, that we are going to have standards as well as openness. And no single standard can cover every single aspect. So regulations will exist, and we will work within those regulations. Some of those regulations may be religious, they may be spiritual, they may be personal, they may be regulatory, they may be physical, they may be laws of physics. And so within those, I think everything we do will be made as a constraint. So I think we've got to keep hold of that complexity. So I'm, I completely agree with ethical design as a stance. And we talk about human-centered design. Um, the issue I have with human centers is once again, we've spent since the Enlightenment years getting the human out of the center and putting the sun in the center and actually not in the center anymore. So the move from human centered to ethical design makes sense. But I kind of want to make a plea for moving from ethical design, because ethics can also be about social ethics, it can be environmental ethics, they will conflict. So if you're designing for a culture, it may not be good for the environment. If you're designing for the environment, it may not be good for the bottom line. So I want to hold on to that complexity and actually argue more for hopeful design. And I think we have to have hope. Okay. Um, so another question. Um, so again, when we start talking about those, uh, did you want to say something? Oh. Um, so we start talking about those autonomous devices that can get an autonomy on, on themselves. So uh, the, when we interact with the physical world, then there is always this uh, situation in which you can have one device that might actually help someone, that might actually create like a job for the people. So obviously when we are in a centralized system, it's quite obvious that uh, the person that is responsible for the device is the person that controls the device. Um, so how do you see it from like a government or from a regulatory perspective or from a design perspective? How can we design the system and um, make sure that like, how, how can we assign responsibility? Or who is actually responsible for the costs that are caused by the devices? How can the community uh, govern itself and the devices in order to avoid this from happening and if it happens in order to act upon it? Um, uh, of course, this all gets into uh, a large legal framework uh, and arguing who is responsible for certain decisions. But um, I'm sorry to mention it again. We, we have a drinking game where every time I mention that I'm at Ostrom, you have a drink. Um, but, but Three of the uh, uh, principles that she argued for, for sustainable um, uh, cognitive resource management, was that there should be uh, monitoring uh, uh, by the uh, people who are involved in the situation or by agencies appointed by them. There should be a system of graduated sanctions so that if you did something wrong, there would be proportional punishment. Uh, and there should be um, uh, easy access to cheap forms of uh, dispute resolution. So the answer is, who's taking responsibility for when things go wrong? Us. The commons. The commons, <laughs> yes. Exactly, yes. But of course, it's not always that simple with things like, for example, self-driving cars, um, which have to make, say, an ethical decision between killing you and killing two school children. Um, and if the car takes the decision to kill you instead, uh, where does the weight of that decision lie? Um, and these are just, you know, and, and you might say that, you know, we make these decisions ourselves, of course, um, and that insurance will probably cover it one way or another. 
um, and that we will involve those institutions to do so. But they are going to be questions that come up. But I think more interestingly for me, what happens when we have self-driving cars and then we see that they're so much safer uh, that it becomes almost criminal to drive your own car and then we outlaw those. So now you can choose between a Google car, a Tesla car, and maybe you know an Uber car to get to where you're going. Um, and they decide which routes you take, where you can go, where you can't go, because maybe some places are deemed a little uh, you know, off the grid. Um, I think that those are interesting questions. Yeah, and also at this point, if it becomes that uh, when someone needs to decide which kind of car to, which kind of car to drive, then if I take a self-driving car, which is certified and etc., then I know that I'm, I cannot be held liable because it, it, was, it wasn't me. Whereas the actual, the rational choice of deciding to take the responsibility to be an autonomous driver as a human, then I, I, will, I will actually have to incorporate all the responsibility and all the liability. And which is where we're really getting to being treated like children, to a point where we have that benevolent dictator. Those benevolent dictators are the corporations today more than anything else. Um, and, sorry? Or the insurers. Or the insurers. I mean, we're very excited about the insurance uh, industry in Silicon Valley. Um, so, you know, that's where we, we lose our agency and we're saying, okay, um, tell us what to do um, and, and you're the, you're the benevolent, benevolent dictator and hopefully you will be benevolent. And so, um, so this is, uh, after our thoughts, you, you can do the presentation, Mel. So my last question is, is indeed this, is like, um, um, so it does seem to me, and I hope this is not the case, but it does seem to me that there is some kind of uh, trade-off or tension between um, the, the ability to rely more and to, to create devices which are more and more able to act on their own behalf and then our own agency, our own ability to actually act on our own behalf. So as the, as the devices become smarter and smarter, as they have much more data than we have, they can actually make probably more informed decisions because they have better processing power and they are all connected. And so there is a point in which indeed as, a, as, as individuals, those, those devices which in fact should be regarded as an extension of ourselves and should actually serve our own purpose, they, can, they might actually get so much more um, autonomy on their own and they can get so much more uh, better information and uh, more reliability, let's say, that it might happen that instead of being an extension of ourselves, then we actually become ourselves an extension of those objects. We are, we are actually just like living according to how those devices are suggesting us to life. So if uh, anyone from the panel has something to say about that. Yeah, I mean, that, that was uh, the, the thesis of the Unabomber, right? That we are um, basically becoming extensions of the devices. And um, underlying these um, scenarios um, where you have the intelligence of the devices being so much stronger than ours, I think might be a fallacy about what artificial intelligence actually can do. And uh, artificial, artificial intelligence has been doomed and, and vast, but um, underneath, we haven't come by far as far as um, 2015 when it sounded, where we thought um, computers would be much further than just being able to now finally recognize speech uh, to some degree. And uh, I would like to flip that around and say maybe we are going to see in the future that we will become much more aware of what it really means to be a human being and uh, what our decisions are actually um, tapping into uh, when we see what the limited limits of the devices are. In case I'm right about the, the, um, the limit of pure data and pure algorithm uh, run devices. And I'm, uh, I know quite a little bit about um, computers and uh, I have found little that um, indicates to me that stuff like, that, that beyond pure data and beyond algorithms is actually what is making up human beings and their decisions. Yeah, and speaking to that, uh, we will continue to evolve with our technologies and soon we will be the cyber. So who we are is another question and who we will become uh, in the interaction with the technology, but that is a very long conversation. Um, and, um, and what I would like to bring up is also um, coming back to the automatic, to, to the self-driving car and the, of his choice example which he uh, he gave us um, which one should the car kill uh, you know 
know, there, there has to be someone accountable all the time. But, you know, in a world in which uh, we believe in God, <laughs> Uh, accountability that you were there is sometimes enough and uh, if I was there and there was a bus with 20 children I would self-sacrifice so you know there are choices which in tragic cases we can make uh, and I just want to leave it here because you know of course we have the choice to stop the technology and not to choose the self-driving car uh, um. On the, on the issue of computer ethics, I know people who have really tried to uh, uh, write logic programs that will reproduce the decisions that people make. I mean, in, in essence, you know, the, the, the ethical choices that the computer will make will be the ones that we program into them. Um, on, the, on the question, uh, <coughs> I think there has always been a tension or a trade-off between tools and skills. A couple of thousand years ago, the tool that you had was a slave, so you got slaves to do all the uh, things that you didn't want to do, uh, <coughs> and that just freed up your time to pursue other skills. Uh, and I think it's the same with <coughs> technology. I think we, we overestimate the potential capabilities of uh, artificial intelligence. And <coughs> even if it's the case that these things, as they already do, the phone and the sat nav take out the map reading skills. Uh, you just find other skills. I don't think we should underestimate the potential and the creativity of humans to do something worthwhile with their time. Um, um, and, and, sorry. Just, uh, and, and just to, to your uh, question that the device will take over our life, let's say in my home, they will decide. It's again a, a matter of design and I I know that my colleagues are going to, to go deeper into that, but that's the idea is how do we design this you know, ambient intelligence uh, with, with all the devices around us. They are human-centered design and they, they are there to, to serve us. If we design them like that, then I think we wouldn't run in that situation. You know, maybe I may have a blind spot there. Uh, I feel that the one thing that we need to remember is whether or not artificial intelligence lives up to its potential. Um, what we're building with these technologies is the infrastructure of tomorrow. Um, uh, someone mentioned earlier that you know we are replacing our public sphere with a private sphere. That's what we're doing, in essence, because they are all privately owned, although we might think of them as a public sphere still. For example, Twitter, we think, is a democratic instrument where we can speak our minds and instrument of democracy, but you know, we see it as a park and it's really actually a shopping mall. Um, and if the owner of the shopping mall doesn't like your t-shirt, they can throw you out. They're well within their rights. It's private space, it's private property. Um, and I think what we overlook sometimes is that the reason it's doing so well, I mean, if they have this toxic model, they must be doing something really right because we're all using it, is the convenience. And we cannot compete with convenience by creating things that are inconvenient and then telling people use them because of our ideology. Look at how beautiful our ideology is. They're just not going to do it. So the only chance that we have is to create things that are as convenient or more convenient. Remember that we actually have um, a user experience advantage. When you think of a company like Google, they have to do a very hard thing. They need to design for two audiences with orthogonal needs. Their customers, the people who actually pay them, and their users, the people that they sell to their customers. That's hard in design. You know, and, and they fail, like Google, uh, sorry, Facebook fails, right? They keep failing and then their users revolt and they go, oh, we made a mistake, sorry, they didn't. They implemented a feature that was for the use of their customers and their users did not like it. It's very hard and they're doing a great job at it. But if you only have one audience, just the people who use your product, you have a huge, 100% user experience advantage in terms of design. That's huge. That's what we squander in the free and open source world. If we stopped squandering that, we would be actually able to build products that are not as convenient, but more convenient than their centralized counterparts. It's not easy, but it's possible. And yet, even with more convenient, aren't we going to become hooked to the other technologies? 
I'm hooked, hooked on Google, I must say, yes. Hooked. So if you make your technology very convenient. Well, no, because Google requires you to use their technologies as much as possible. The more you use it, the more data you generate and the more money they make. If your business model is not built on that, then you don't have to make them so that people get hooked because you don't gain anything when they use it more often than they should or they want to because they're addicted. You make your money elsewhere. So if the fundamental uh, business model is different, then of course your product is going to look very different as well. Although I hope I will be hooked to your technology. I don't want you to be hooked. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, I think we have Pretty much no more time. Um, I would just like to ask one last thing, and only one person gets to answer. So whoever is the first. Um, so we talk a lot about ethical design and uh, hope design and whatnot. So um, to go back to the original topic of the blockchain, um, in the context of the Internet of Things, how do you see that uh, using the blockchain can actually, or how can we use the blockchain in order to implement this ethical and hopeful design? And then to, and to continue on what we were just saying, uh, is the use of the blockchain actually providing, if we properly design it, this kind of competitive advantage over the counterpart centralized infrastructure, which will then lead people to rather get hooked to the blockchain implementation of uh, the IoT? I don't know who wants to get that question. I've talked enough. I think the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is, is maybe. <laughs> Great last comment. <laughs> because, I mean, you said only one person. I think we kind of speak to each other, either all or nobody. <laughs> okay, so that's something to think about. So thank you, everyone. Thank you.